Big carry. It was a weekend to remember for front rowers in week six of the fantasy major league rugby season. On this week's episode of the Fantasy Rugby Show, we give the big boys their flowers and what was a stellar performance by a handful of them in week six. Break down the matches that happened. Look ahead to some waiver wire pickups coming up this week. And of course, preview week seven. That should be an exciting one. The Fantasy Rugby Show starts right now. Where rugby and the world of fantasy sports collide. Welcome to the Fantasy Rucker Show. Bringing fantasy rugby to the masses. Talking all things rugby from the MLR to leagues around the world. We're on top of it. Headphones on, pads off. This is the Fantasy Rucker Show. Now, here are your hosts, Ryan Yee, Matt Yee, and Devin Vanderpool. What's up, everybody? This is episode number 103 of the Fantasy Rucker Show. Thank you so much to our Fantasy Ruckers League members, our community members, and everyone else tagging along on this journey of making fantasy rugby a reality in the MLR with you every single week. Matt and Ryan Yee here on another edition of the Fantasy Rucker Show. And we got a jam-packed episode in this one after what was an exciting week six that was mm-hmm. all about the big boys, like we said. Man, big boys carrying some teams through here in this yep. week six of the Fantasy MLR season. But, Maddie, before uh, we get into any of that, get into a little bit of waiver wire, get into, obviously, a look ahead of, of week seven coming up, uh, how, how does it feel to now be behind Supreme Commissioner Yi, you've been giving me a whole bunch of flack to start yep. the season, and look at look at this—a big time win from uh, the Supreme Commissioner puts me right back on top of the host of this show. Well, hey, way to go! Look, everybody gets beginner's luck at some point. Uh, <laughs> Vandy and I were just chugging along. It's a long season, you know, no big deal. Uh, lots of room there in the playoffs, there, so we're not worried. I'm going to speak for Vandy on this. We're not worried. Uh, <laughs> I am one place ahead of Vandy, so he kind of stinks. So uh, he's probably crying right now. Uh, but yeah, I'm not worried, man. I think uh, I think you'll realize just how long the season is, and you'll realize just how quickly the tides can turn over there. But your team's looking pretty good. Looking not too bad. Uh, yeah, we're about a third way through the season. I understand. I understand. It is a long, long year. But hey, a little bit of a confidence booster after week six, that's for sure. Put up some big time points. Obviously, went up against. Devin Vandy Vanderpool is not here on the show. I think yeah. I must have scared him off here because it was I'm a pretty sure whooping. It was a whooping in this one. Bent him over and and showed him who's boss. Wow. What can I say? Wow. What can I say? Ryan, show but... him who's boss. <laughs> Come on now. What? Come on now. What? You can't be showing him who's boss. Why? At least say that to his face. Okay. Well, wait till he comes back here uh, next episode. Vandy on a business trip. He's actually in my neck of the woods here, uh, hanging out in Baltimore for some, I guess, big time. Uh, and still uh, has never flown a plane. And still has never flown a plane. Him and the boys driving in a truck down to Baltimore. I can only imagine. So we'll Mm -hmm. see. Uh, We'll see uh, when he comes back here next episode to uh, give him a little bit of a talking to. Uh, And I'm sure I won't let him forget after the big time win. But like we said at the top of the show, got a jam-packed one in this one. Uh, Week six breakdown. We're going to dish out some team of the week honorees because we had some big time performances in this past week. Talk a little bit about waiver wire, of course. Just like we did last week in episode 102, we're going to get into some guys that you might need to look at in terms of maybe some drop candidates to make some room for yep. these guys that you're going to be picking up. And then, of course, look ahead to week seven and give you some of our predictions. We've been doing pretty good. Pretty good on uh, the prediction side of things, Matty. Uh, only, I believe, uh, I've gotten six wrong so far uh, with a couple ties thrown in there so far. Yeah, I mean, obviously trying to uh, trying to uh, think outside the box has been to me a couple times. Uh, <laughs> and has got me a couple times you got to risk it for the biscuit uh, and also the dire support for nola seems to continue to bite me but we will get into that we will definitely get into that uh so uh yeah let, let's jump right in but like we say every single episode if you aren't already give us a follow on socials mm-hmm. uh youtube x instagram facebook at the fantasy ruckers handle up above on the youtube video down below in the description if you're listening on the pod like subscribe all that good stuff really goes a long way Coaching on 100 here. So we want to hit that number. Uh, join along here. It's been a lot of fun. Join the Discord if that's not all uh, enough for you. A uh, nice little community over there. The link to do that is in the description. And hey, if you haven't already, check out the fantasyruckers.com, the mastermind behind it, Alistair Kirschpool. Got to give him a shout out every mm-hmm. single episode. Been absolutely brilliant behind it. It's been a really, really fun platform and a revamped site to use this year uh, as we continue to trudge along this journey that is fantasy rugby in Major League Rugby. 
pretty good stuff. All right. Let's go. Well, let's let's get right into the episode, Maddie. Uh, news and notes to start off here. Um, interesting news. Again, it's kind of slowed down a little bit, at least from a mm-hmm. roster standpoint. We kind of know where people are at. Uh, but we have been waiting on a couple names to make appearances here in the 2024 Major League Rugby season. And one guy that we've been waiting on is K-Train. Tavita Kuradrani, one of the biggest signings of the offseason, probably one of the biggest signings in Major League Rugby history overall, honestly, as uh, as kind of a marquee name. He's he's up there. Well, um, uh, he definitely is up there, but not, there's not, a guy the, named not, Ma'ananu no, that that's, still exists. That's fair enough. I don't think he's the best, but he's among, I would say, top five, I think, uh, yeah, uh, up in there, uh, I believe. But uh, hey, uh, it was announced heading into week six that he was making his first appearance for the Seawolves. And uh, he does just Mm -hmm. that uh, against the Dallas Jackals. Doesn't really have that impactful of a a fantasy uh, MLR performance. But nonetheless, cool to see K-Train out there suiting up in a Major League Rugby uniform. I mm-hmm. think he's going to make an impact here if he's able to uh, stay consistently on the field when it comes to that Seawolves lineup. But hey, Matty, you you dropped a big fat bucks on him heading into the waiver wire to pick him up after I drafted him and dropped him after not seeing him play for five weeks. Uh, but what 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 was your thoughts kind of when this news came out and after the week that was with Kuradrani? How are you feeling having him on your squad? Yeah, you know what? I thought, what the heck? Why not? Why why not throw the rest of my fab on him? Uh, you know. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So we're just hoping here that Seattle's offense kind of picks it up. Uh, they start gelling with the new lineup. I think they've had a new lineup almost every game. Mm-hmm. So uh, hopefully that they can start gelling together and figure out how to best use Tavita Kurajani. They were trying to get him involved, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but they were trying to get him involved, um, and I can only see that continuing from here on out. Yeah, uh, 3.6 fantasy points in this one in 57 minutes played. Only 20 meters gained and seven tackles. But again, we'll break mm-hmm. that down in the Seattle Dallas Jackals breakdown coming up in about 10 to 15 minutes here. But cool to see K-Train in the Seawolves jersey. Finally, uh, you outbid me there by $1 to get him. Um, and I'm sure in the long run, that's no, definitely going <laughs> to uh, bite me in the butt because I drafted him, like I said, uh, dropped him after not seeing him. And I felt... Pretty bad after I saw that you had outbid me by that little there. So um, I guess we'll have to uh, have to see how it all pans out there for K-Train in uh, the Pacific Northwest. All right, switching on to uh, the last bit of news here. Uh, Nico Jones is returning to Moana Pacifica in Super Rugby. Uh, He hasn't appeared for the Old Glory DC all season long yet. He's been an injury cover for Moana Pacifica, so he hasn't been with the Mm -hmm. uh, Old Glory DC side. He was fantasy relevant last season he started uh i believe in like five or six straight games to end uh the season in 2023 had a couple double digit fantasy performances in there was definitely fantasy relevant but looks like uh he's going to be taking his talents uh back to super rugby and appearing uh uh there in uh in in moana pacifica colors there for the upcoming uh rest of the upcoming year yeah he gets to go back home i mean he gets to go back to auckland uh, or continue to play in Auckland and, and play for Moana Pacifica, who actually aren't having too bad of a season uh, given their history. But uh, yeah, Outside good of- luck to him. I mean, we love we love seeing we love seeing uh, guys from the MLR kind of make their statement in some of the bigger leagues. Outside of a whooping from my Waikato Chiefs this past weekend, I gotta say, I'll just throw that in there. Yeah, but no, no, yeah, okay. uh, that's okay. Uh, but yeah, and like you mentioned, Matt, it's always good to see guys using the ma- uh, Major League Rugby as a platform to return to these higher level leagues. Again, we know our place where Major League Rugby stands in the ethos of professional rugby in the world. And again, it's mm-hmm. just a, a stepping stone to you. So it's cool to see Nico Jones uh, playing a little bit here in Major League rugby last season and now moving uh, back up to what is probably the most talented professional rugby league in the entire world. Um, So Nico Jones back with Moana Pacifica. All right. Well, again, not much news and notes to go over. So, hey, let's hop right in. Let's move things along. Keep it moving here and uh, give you a little bit of a fantasy Rutgers league update. Hear ye, hear ye. Hear ye, hear ye, here is Supreme Commissioner Yi with a Fantasy Rutgers League update. Maddie, just, just a quick story. I know you're giving me the booze here. You're throwing the tomatoes. Are out. But in our group chat, uh, Vandy, you, and myself were 
talking back and forth about today's show and he sent us a screenshot about where he is in uh, in Maryland when it comes to his business trip and you saw a notification come down on the top uh, when I texted him in that screenshot and Vandy actually has me listed in his phone as Commissioner yes, Yee and I can absolutely we love to see this? it. Can we preface this so that you have been our commissioner for the fantasy football league for the past like seven years? That's true. So That's true. that before <laughs> your time here, okay. It is not because of your supremeness in the fantasy Rutgers MLR landscape. Okay, Ryan, I don't know. It Re is because you have history <laughs> of being Vanny's commissioner in all the leagues that he loses. Well, okay? uh, recency bias, recency bias. All, all I saw was commissioner Yee, And I think my eyes yeah, yeah, put yeah, Supreme yeah, yeah, in front yeah, of that. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's all I know. But anyways, let's get into this fantasy Rutgers league update. And, and like we do every single week, we start off with our fantasy Rutgers weekly challenge, which is a way for you to dip your toes in the world of fantasy MLR. You pick a lineup, five guys, have a $15 budget you select the five positions and you see how well you can do and and we have a brand new leader for the weekly that challenge stinks. I have been dethroned I will admit it I know yes, when to say stinks. it but it's rugby mornings John Fitzpatrick again coming up with a number one performance I believe that's two weeks in a row and now he is leading the weekly challenge with 316.9 total fantasy points after putting up 59 this past week with his lineup I will say I came in second. Uh, I am in second this past week, but I've been falling a little bit. I had a 16th uh, lineup, uh, best lineup here in our weekly challenge. Matty, you didn't do too bad. 10th, top 10, which is pretty good. You're sitting in third. Uh, so yeah, weekly challenge has been, a, been a whole lot of fun. Yeah, that was a tough pick for me too. Uh, but we'll get into kind of the challenges that uh, Povey had for that Utah Warriors lineup in just a bit. But uh, weekly challenge, been a lot of fun. Uh, lots of movement. Alistair Kirschpool, our very own website guru. He's been participating, getting his taste of fantasy MLR, sitting in fourth after a third, uh, third uh, overall performance this past week and week six pretty pretty cool stuff it's been a lot of fun to kind of yep. uh, go through this different strategies here uh we post our our lineup every single week at the fantasy records on socials and it's fun to kind of uh give the wider audience a chance at mm -hmm. trying out fantasy mlr yeah you try you see how hard it is mm -hmm. you figure it out you can see the only <laughs> the vets are sitting there right at the top you know fitzy me ryan's kind of there beginners luck he probably rigged oh, okay. also kirsch pool also probably you know He's got the back end stuff, so he's working it too. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, that, no, you know it's that... great. I think I think the nice thing is seeing that number of people uh, being involved, mm -hmm. even though like they can't be part of the, uh, even though like they'll it'll hurt them in the total ranking, mm -hmm. the weekly rank they can just continue. And hey, maybe you score enough points, you picked enough guys, you get a join up. But it's nice to see that number grow from yeah. the first week. And, and that's a, and that's a fun uh, fun little way. Like, we got a couple YouTube comments on our previous videos about man. This yeah. weekly challenge is hard, but hey, that's the good thing about this thing. There's always next week. So if you want a, a shot at it, if you haven't yet, you still got a chance to do it every single week. Link to do that is down below in the description to sign up on our website, thefantasyruckers.com. Um, been a whole bunch of fun uh, with the weekly challenge. Uh, definitely going to uh, keep this around for, for a mm -hmm. lot of while longer. It's a lot of fun. All right. And oh, yeah. uh, uh, last bit of our uh, Fantasy Ruckers League update is we like to do this every single week. Highlight our top performers from our main Main fantasy Rutgers leagues. We got five of them in this season. So it's been fun to kind of see how different leagues have been operating, who's been performing, who's had some pretty killer weeks. And man, we had another week of pretty killer weeks. Uh, we start off with our tryhards league because we they had a fantasy manager in that league putting up 132 fantasy points. Scary Larry Rugby putting Holy up 132. Crap. That might be one of the highest that we've ever seen in all of fantasy MLR up to this point. It's definitely up there. Yeah, that is pretty high up there. So good kudos to him. Uh, he's probably got a stack team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, And then coming down, look who's at your number two spot. It only okay. took a little bit of time. I don't Supreme care. Supreme Commissioner Yi of the stinks. Fantasy Rutgers League this guy stinks. is in second with 122.7 points. You know what? Come Good on. job, Ryan. Good job, Ryan. You just have to say? wait for Fido to come back. You have to wait for LaRue Milan to come back. Good job. I, I, even, I even benched the old Coatsa this past week and, and still was able to put up that. Point All right. Level, Tushan so. still scored like three tries. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Let's see. All right. Coming on uh, third here, 116.8 fantasy points for Kankaki kickers of the Lou Malnati's deep dish league coming in at fourth, 109.2 points. Kankaki kickers. That's not English. Kankaki. That's pretty good. I don't know. It's creative. 
Kankakee, okay. K- Kankakee kickers or scary Larry rugby? Yeah, I don't know. I don't <laughs> All right, well, coming in at fourth, 109.2 points by the Scattered Rattlers, which is a pretty good name of the Scrum and Coke League. And then coming in at fifth, 98 and a half points, Jackal King Army of the Ruck This League. Honorable mention of the Lou Malnati's Deep Dish League, uh, our uh, commissioner of that league, Chicago Carnivores, Nick, putting up 100.8. So we had another uh, triple digit performance there, a total of five this past week. Let's go. Uh, I'll get there one day. Probably okay. not though. Yeah, I feel like last season you had, I think, what when you were like on a tear there, you went like like ten straight weeks with triple digit performances or something. Oh, oh, oh yeah, that it was, was pretty. Dream. That was, was when I had a winger in my scrum half position. Though those were the good old days. All right, well, let's shift on over to this week six breakdown, Maddie, and let's start talking about these games. Uh, pretty fun week. Uh, jam packed. Two teams on by Houston, San yep. Diego, not planned, yep. and we opened up uh, with a handful of Friday matches. I believe this was the first Friday that we've had multiple I, matches. I don't know, man. I. Uh, how how am I? What am I supposed to do here? Like, the first game was what at nine, and then yeah. the next game was at at ten thirty. Ten thirty, yeah. I mean, it was all right. Yeah, I guess if you're on the West Coast, it's all right. But look, I've got like it's tough. It's tough to stay up that late. I mean, I work the evening shift at work, so I get home like, and I have it going and and staying up, and it kind of it was, and this is completely. Uh, has nothing to do with rugby, but I went from the Seawolf Dallas Jackals game right into the Japan qualifiers. So for F1, wow. so it was a that nice little up late. <laughs> it was well, a nice look, little evening. Friday was Friday was fine. Saturday MLR, like figure it out. I know, I know. Just but figure it out. We'll get into it. Uh, but let's start off the first match of the Friday. Utah Warriors uh, sitting at uh, two and three now after a big time win over Anthem Rugby Carolina, who is still looking for their first franchise win. Uh, yep. pretty interesting match here because it, oh, was, it almost happened. It almost happened because it was it a almost close happened. One Robbie Povey orbit. almost single handedly <laughs> allowed Anthem Carolina to get their first win. Uh, no, it was it was a windy game. Uh, clearly, I think you could tell from the conversion kicks that Robbie Povey was kicking. Um, they were absolutely atrocious. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, Utah, I think. I don't know why, but the way that they played with Robbie Povey in was just completely different uh, than the way that they play with Joel Hodgson. And you saw that the minute Joel Hodgson came in, like in the start of the second half, mm-hmm. uh, Robbie Povey was just playing deep the whole team, which caused the whole back line to be deep. Anybody off 10 would be very deep. Um, they were stagnant when they got the ball. They were one dimensional. They didn't have much on. And, you know, like that's just you're not going to be able to beat this team that way. Like you, you have to at least do something in order to manipulate defense and get the ball wide to exploit where the weakness is for Anthem. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. And and the other thing is I just thought like the Utah defense just looked awful. They looked atrocious. Yeah. Um, I thought they were just like really bad in the tackle. Um, but to me, Anthem dominated this game until Joel Hodgson came on. And at that point forward, Utah kind of dominated the rest of the way. Um, but this Anthem team to me, I mean, they look good with ball in hand. I like the way they look. I don't think they're, I think their offense is one that you are not afraid to start guys from. Yeah. I mean, yeah. guys like David Sill, guys like Junior Gaffa, guys like Terang Atira, Waitokia, Oscar Collar, all mm-hmm. these guys, you're not scared to play these guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're no longer also a team that you're just saying, Hey, I'm going to put my guys against like the only positions that I would say that you maybe want to put your guys against is set piece front row and back three. Other yeah. than that, it's not always a given. You're not going to be given the points like we used to with Dallas and whatnot. Like, and and it's interesting you mentioned that, Maddie, because I think the reason why you pick the front row back three positions is just the likelihood of scoring tries. Like, I mean, there's yeah. Anthem are giving up points here, but in your yep. conventional sense, it's not as much of a gimme like you're saying. You're just trying to find who is scoring exactly. those points, and it's just a little bit difficult sometimes to to figure out. A lot of people were starting Joe Mono this week with an expectation of him going off. Michael Manson was ending up being the guy that was well, the guy you wanted to have your but, lineup. But but there we go. It's like back three, right? Like sure. that's where the weakness is for this anthem defense, and you can tell that when you watch them. Um, and Michael Manson was a perfect example of like how to exploit that because they got him the ball with space. And he was able to use his speed, use how slippery he is in order to essentially just exploit the gaps that are there outside. So they did a good job in that. Um, But yeah, look, it was a different game when Joel Hodgson came on. Hodgson 
took the ball in the line, put the D under pressure, and actually put Anthem under pressure. But I uh, I really like the way that this Anthem team looks. So before we hand out some team of the week on a reason, start talking about some of these individual performances, at least right now, what is your concern level when it comes to this Utah Warriors team? Obviously, a lot of optimism heading into this season with how electric the offense has been, dealt with some injuries to start the season. They yep. don't win as dominantly as they, I think a lot of people thought they would in this matchup against Anthem. Some of that being, you know, Anthem playing a lot better than people are expecting at this point of the season, partly because Utah is still not performing at the level that people are expecting. How concerned are you for the Warriors right now? I mean, look, they've had a rough start to the season with injuries. Uh, it's hard to kind of gel when you've got that many injuries and so many lineups that they've had i think it'll be nice for them to get on a little bit of roll of a roll i think we saw a little sneak peek of what how lethal their offense could be mm-hmm. with michael manson with joe mono with mika cruze all these guys in the lineup mm-hmm. um and i think they've realized that hey you know joel hodson i'm sorry but you're gonna have to play 80 minutes every week because we need you in order to run our offense so um I'm not concerned necessarily. I think, I think the, regardless of what they do, they're going to have it tough for the rest of the year. Their conference is just way too good, and I mm-hmm. can't see them necessarily beating out any of the other Western Conference teams that are ahead of them in order to make playoffs. All right, well, let's get into some individual performances. You mentioned his name, Michael Manson, 32.8 fantasy points for the highest uh, fantasy performance in week six. Uh, Just an electric, electric game by Manson. I mean, two tries, 260 meters gained in the full 80 minutes played. He's our back three team of the week player. Uh, Michael Manson, you mentioned him, Maddie. He was one of your starts of the week this uh, this week, and he showed up here uh, on week, uh, week six. Slippery. He's fast. He knows what to do with the ball in space. He's a guy that has to be on all your teams and starting all the time. At this point of the year, would you rather have Michael Manson or Mikey Teo? Michael Manson. All right. Uh, to me, yeah. Michael Manson, just he gets opportunities. Mikey Teo, his opportunities have not been there this season. Gotcha. All right. Michael Manson or Caleb McAnney? Michael Manson. Okay. That's huge. I would... I. I. I I hope Michael Manson continues to play at 15. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I yeah. The we'll, two we'll the, what, the 200 what, what, meters gain there and that match is a large portion of We'll see how yeah, we'll see how it we'll see how it looks, but I think they've clearly seen that look, we need to have Michael Manson needs a ball in his hand. So what that looks like where he sits, where Caleb Mackney sits, we'll find out. Yeah. All right. Well, second team of the week honoree in this one is at the second row position and not often are you getting mm-hmm. let alone 15 plus points from the second row position, 20 plus points from the second row position, over 25 points by Frank Lawchor, uh, 27.3 fantasy points in this one. If you had him, you were probably winning your matchup this week. The advantage that he gave you in uh, an excellent, excellent performance for Utah. Uh, This is a guy that had uh, two tries, 73 meters gained, 25 tackles, a breakdown steal, playing the full 80 minutes once again. In every match that he has started and played in, he has played the full 80. He is your marquee second row player right now moving into yeah, this season. Yeah, he's just a does-everything player. So uh, it's it's great to see him out there playing. I think he's he's just a dominant force for that team. And then uh, last on the Utah Warriors side, uh, back row, Dylan Nell, 17.2 fantasy points for him mm-hmm. for our Team of the Week back row player. And then on the Carolina side, uh, got to give a shout-out to Ter- Teranga Tira Waitokia. Again, another solid performance. He's gone four straight weeks with double-digit fantasy performance ever since he mm-hmm. started in round three. 19.9 fantasy points in this one with 92 meters gained, three try assists. He was moving the ball well, nine tackles. Uh, and he, he was... He was impactful there for the uh, the anthem. They're one of those guys that kind of reflects what you're saying, Matt, is that there is fantasy value to be had here with this Carolina team. Yeah, he's going to continue to be a focal point of that offense and a key playmaker in that offense, and he he was everywhere. 
on then, Friday night. And then just a couple guys before we shift on to the next game. Mika Kruse, 18.7 points for him. Junior Gaffa, 18.5. David Still, 16 points. And then Declan Moore, 17 fantasy points for the anthem at the front row position. 114 meters gained, 12 tackles for a front oh, row player. Yeah. Pretty good. Uh, he might be a guy that uh, we talk about a little bit in uh, in, uh, in a bit here. Uh, but Declan Moore, not something that you saw always see at that front row position. All right, shifting on now to the uh, next matchup of the Friday. And it was a good one. The Seattle Seawolves taken on the Dallas Jackals. The Seawolves coming out on top. They now move to five and one. The Dallas Jackals fall to two and three or two and four, excuse me, in the 34 to 32 loss. They still grab two bonus points, though, scoring the four plus drives and losing within seven. So still pretty solid there for Dallas. But man, I mean, this Dallas Jackals team. That two and four record does not reflect how good this team can be because they kept up neck and neck with the Seattle Seawolves. And I mean, we'll go right into it because you can't talk about this match without talking about a guy named DeWalt Kota who scored five tries in this match on the back of a Dallas Jackal set piece that was absolutely rolling. He now has the highest single game try number in the history of the MLR taking over the spot when Dean Muir scored four tries in 2022. DeWalt Coatsa yep. is incredible. And I mean, he better thank the Seattle, the Seattle team because boy, that Seattle team just did not care about taking penalties. Um, even though they saw how strong Dallas Jackal's set piece was uh, and they just continued to kind of take penalties and put Dallas in good position in order to continue to score points. I mean, when they score five tries off driving malls, you know that you've messed up. Mm-hmm. You know that you have caused yourself harm by taking penalties with ill discipline. Um, and that's just what happened. I mean, to me, look, Seattle, I think offensively, they have these like sparks. They look good and then and then they they don't. And I think that they're, they're just trying to gel. They have so have had so many different lineups. Their mm-hmm. center pairings has been different. They've had new guys coming in, new guys on the wing. Devin Rousseau playing center, playing back three, Duncan Matthews coming in, coming out. I just think that there's instances of them that they're just out of sync and they just need some time to figure it out, I think, and time to kind of learn to play with one each one and one another. Um, I will say this. They clearly tried to get Kurajani in, in, in the game early. They gave him plenty of crash balls that he did absolutely nothing with. Um, but it was one dimensional. I think it was just the way for them. Like, Hey, you need touches. We're going to get you touches. Um, take the ball in and just do what you can. If you make something out of it, then you make something out of it. Um, and for Dallas, I mean, to me, like their offense is, oh, I love watching their offense. They are so high pace. Juan D Olivier is moving the ball very quickly. Uh, I'm I'm a big fan of this offense. I'm a big fan of watching Vaughn Isaacs. And obviously you have to be a big fan of that Dallas set piece. So you know how we said at the start of the year that now that I'm in this thing, I got to pick a favorite team. Mm. The Dallas Jackals might be that team. Well, you have to reach us out. Somebody's got to get you a jersey now. Because I think it's the perfect, uh, they're coming up. You know, they're still, they still got to make improvements here. They're, they're, you're just not necessarily hopping on the bandwagon here, but like what you're saying, Maddie, just it's, they're a fun team to watch. And, yeah. and, who would have expected them to have gotten two bonus points, losing just by two uh, off of a five try performance at Dewalt Kotza? I mean, come on. I mean, th- th- this was this was a lot of fun here. It was late, but it, it was a good, good match here. And and again, I think there are concerns around Seattle, but I think this is more reflective also. I mean, just how much of an improvement Dallas has made in the time that they've been yeah. in this league. And it, it's really cool to see. Seattle's going to have to sort out their discipline issues. I think they're one of the highest penalized teams in the league. They're going to have to figure that out uh, because they can't, they can't be giving five tries off of set piece, five tries off of driving malls. Uh, The driving malls become way too strong in this league. And uh, yeah, I mean, let's, let's start dishing out team of the week on a reason. I mean, we got it. We talked about, no, no, who's there. DeWalt Kota. I mean, the front row team of the week, Honoree there, 30.4 fantasy points. I mean, what front row does that? This is the second time this season that he scored at least a hat trick, five tries in this one, three tries in that crazy 20-point crazy. performance in round one. He's gone half of his matches, three out of six matches he scored a try. 
He's starting uh, the lowest minutes played he's had was 50 in round three, but he went from 78 in round one, 68 in round two, 50 in round three, 63 in round four, 88 in round five, 81 in round six. This guy's a machine. Double digit tackles last week. A question for you, Maddie. Is the wall Kota just a I know often with the front row position, it's kind of a a matchup based type decision there. Um, you know, what team are they going up against? Can they take advantage of of the set piece there? Is the wall Kota just a lock in that front row position now? Every single I think week. He, he has to be. I mean, Dallas, like I noted here that it's clearly some part of their game plan that we are going to drive. I mean, you see them do it even at like the 50, mm-hmm. right? Like they are going to drive. Um, and they're going to utilize that. And as long as the wall coats is in the back of that and steering the ship, he clearly has shown that he knows how to finish. So, um, yeah, he, he's a must start regardless of who they're playing. The Dallas Jackals set piece seems to find a way to get it done. And of course, if your hooker is scoring five tries off the set piece, that means your set piece is doing pretty good too. The Dallas Jackals team of the week defense set piece for week six, 12 total fantasy points in this one. Uh, you were, uh, you had, a lot of points there from that position. Huge advantage if you had the Dallas mm-hmm. Jackals. I know they were a big pickup at the early start of the year. It looks like you have another one of those plug-and-play defense set piece. I mean, you don't have many options anyways with the defense set piece, uh, with there obviously being only 12 teams and, and ranging in those eight-team leagues, especially in our 10-team fantasy Rutgers league. But if you were able to get a scoop up of Dallas Jackals, you are mm-hmm. very comfortable having them in your lineup moving forward. For sure. And then just a couple guys that we want to highlight. Dan Creel finally coming out here. Uh, 19.8 fantasy points for his season high so far. Uh, we were kind of waiting for this kind of boom game from Dan Creel. And this was somewhat of a, of a, of a breakout game for him. We'll see whether or not he can carry it forward. 104 meters gain, eight tackles, a breakdown steal. You add a try on top of that. Good to see Dan Creel get back into the high scoring point column. Von Isaacs, yep. like you mentioned, Matt, 15.2 fantasy points for him. Uh, 12.3 points for back row Sam to Fuya, uh, and those were about all your double digit yeah. fantasy point performers in this one. Love to Fuya, uh, Von Isaacs, just for managers who own him, just know that as long as Martin Elias is out, I believe he will be kicking off the tee. I made that mistake, uh, and will be making him kicker eligible moving forward, I think. All right, now let's shift on over to our first match of the Saturday. Uh, the Nola Gold at home taking on the Chicago Hounds. And what was a, I think, a pretty surprising result for all of us. Nola losing this one, falling yeah. to three and two. Chicago bumping themselves up to two, three and one. 38 to 21 victory over the Nola Gold. And now they see themselves sitting fourth in the Eastern Conference. What a shocking result by this one. Nola came out up front. Chicago yep. working their way back and and ended up winning this one pretty convincingly. I mean, another case of what that's two weeks in a row. Nola has came out in front. Uh, I mean, not including the bye, but Nola came out in front mm-hmm. early and then lost. Uh, but look, Nola, I just think they their offense just isn't looking that great. A lot of slow ball. They lack continuity. They lack width. They're really just drifting for whatever reason. They're not utilizing JP Duplessis. Uh, I don't understand that. I don't see why you wouldn't utilize one of the biggest players on the pitch and one of the hardest runners. It makes no sense to me because they hardly gave many opportunities. They have a lot of discipline issues and defensively. I mean, they were atrocious in this game. They were missing tackles left and right. They were absolutely atrocious. But enough of the bad, right? You know, getting to Chicago, I thought Chicago showed a, some real, like, I think this is kind of what the Chicago team that we were mm-hmm. hoping for. Um, I think Billy Meeks playing at 12 and being, it didn't mean that he has to stop being a playmaker, but now he can be both. Now yeah. he has a free reign to kind of play his game. And I think this has unlocked their offense. They're getting the ball wide. They're getting the ball to, you know, like Augsburgers finally kind of, kind of getting into it. Um, so I think I think they look really good. Um and yeah, they just completely dominated that second half and they deserve to win that game all out for sure. Yeah. Uh, I I couldn't have said it better myself. Again, this Chicago team just looks so much different when Billy Meeks is at that 12 position. And and like you said, it's still be a distributor. You've got a try assist in this one, which we'll get into his performance. Yep. Uh, but to hand out uh, Team of the Week honoree, the only one in this match was Luke Campbell. And a large portion of that was that snipe that he had, that nice snipe. And that's kind of the Luke Campbell that we'd like to see. And, and Nola might, having, might be having a little bit of a struggle of 
trying to find their footing when it comes to their offensive firepower. But from a fantasy perspective, Luke Campbell has looked pretty solid back to back weeks yeah. now at the scrum at position with double digit fantasy points has 11.7 in this one, 36 meters gained seven tackles and a try back to back weeks with that buy in between now that he's scored and find the try zone. I mean, Luke Campbell is kind of emerging here as one of the top tier scrum halves, despite Nola kind of dealing with some offensive issues. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. He, I think fantasy wise, he's clearly scored tries to get some points, but I think personally, the way that he's playing is just, it's not quick enough. And this is the second year in a row that we've seen that from him. Sure, 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 sure. And I guess then the one bright spot though, of this Nola gold offense is the guy that has uh, returned to this lineup. And that's Ed Fido because yeah. uh, since that first appearance in round four, where he put up 19 and a half fantasy points, scored a try 93 meters gain. He comes back after the bye week now in this one against Chicago has 187 meters gain, a try 25.9 fantasy points and four tackles in there. Ed Fido, I think we're confident to say is back at least in fantasy circles here. He's a plug yeah. and play guy in your lineup. Such a classic game from him too. Just so many opportunities of making something out of nothing and just turning something that you think is five, 10 meter gain into a 70 meter gain and a try. Uh, it's just vintage Ed Fido. Absolutely. Uh, James Scott, uh, second row for Chicago, having a solid one. We'll talk about him more in just a bit here, but 18.2 fantasy points for him. Rodney mm -hmm. Iona, 13.2 at the fly half position, played the full 80. Rodney Iona, I guess before we move on to the next game, is really a guy that you can be confident in despite kind of Nola's struggles if he does play those full 80 minutes. Yeah, yeah for sure. I think there's always a fear of Reese Botha coming in and uh, taking some of those minutes away because he has played well this year. Um, but yeah, I, I think if he's able to play the 80, if he's able to get up there and, and play some of those games, he's looking good. Um, another guy I would like to bring up, I thought Dylan Fawcett kind of mm -hmm. looked like Dylan Fawcett of old, yep. uh, in this game, I think we hope, and I'm sure fantasy managers of Dylan Fawcett are hoping that that trend continues. Uh, but he was looking like old classic Dylan Fawcett that I remember from the New York Ironworker days. Yep, 11 and a half fantasy points for him, two tries with 18 meters gained. Uh, obviously one of those top tier front row players that came off the board in this year's draft. So good to see mm -hmm. him get his high of the season so far and continue to move that forward as the Chicago team charts starts to figure itself out. A couple other guys, Dougie Fife, 12.7 fantasy points for Nola starting at that fullback position. Billy Meeks, like you mentioned, Matt, looks good. Uh, distributor attacking kind of role at that 12 spot, 83 meters gain, a try assist, six tackles in the full 80 played. Uh, all right, let's go to the next game of the Saturday, the New England Free Jacks taking on the Miami Sharks at home. New England coming out on top in what was a stellar defensive performance, um, a, an iconic and a, a very uh, characteristic defensive performance of what the New England Free Jacks do. They bump Holy up to cow. four and one. Miami Sharks now down to one and five and what was a 25 to three victory over the sharks yeah the uh yeah i mean the new England free jacks defense that is everything to talk about this game i think they had a ridiculous number of team tackles um but their defense uh was so clinical it is so clinical their their line speed if you do not do something to try and get them to not be able to set up and not be able to shoot up so easily out on the outside, you will be cooked every time, right? Like Miami just didn't do anything to counter that. Um, and you saw it in just how many dominant tackles the New England Free Jacks had. I mean, if you just watch that game, look at how many double tackles that they have. That mm -hmm. means that the boys are getting off the line. Uh, I will say New England Free Jacks defense is nothing without Ben Lesage. Ben Lesage is one of the best defending centers in the league. I witnessed it firsthand. You can witness it every weekend when the New England Free Jacks play. He is one of the best defending centers in the league, and it is absolutely ridiculous. Um, on the offensive side, I think New England Free Jacks are one of the most organized offensive teams in the league as well. Just an absolute class organization. Um, and Miami, I mean, look, uh, the defense forced them to kick. It forced them to kick all the time. And if you're continuing to kick, New England Free Jacks aren't making mistakes. You're not going to do much with ball in hand. That's true. Uh, and they, yeah, they had, they had another option though. They would go five phases. They would go back 20 meters right. and they would have to put it behind. So um, yeah, it was just an New York, New England Free Jacks just put on an absolute clinic defensively. 
Uh, and I guess a guy that was really reflective of that kind of defensive clinic was, I mean, Josh Larson, uh, yeah. 17 fantasy points in this one, 25 tackles. I try to add on top of that. I mean, Josh Larson is the lifeblood of that kind of forward pack offense. And it's just, it's a lot of fun to see him out there and, and putting on that defensive display. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 25 tackles is ridiculous, but I was going to, I said right after the game, I was like, look, <laughs> there's going to be some guys here. They're going to some crazy tackle counts. Cause those are the free jacks. They were running around everywhere and the forwards are making some big hits. Who do you have more confidence in at this point in the season, the Seattle Seawolves or the new England free jacks? Oh, defense wins championships. Uh, when you have a defense like that, you are, you are good. I, I just think that it'll be interesting because I think teams need to look at what old glory DC did against this new England free Jacks defense mm -hmm. and understand where, where those gaps are. How did, how did, how did they exploit some of those gaps? Because I thought that they did a really good job. And if teams are figuring that out, I think the good teams will figure it out. But for me, Defense wins championship. When you're playing like that, you are going to win a lot of games. And I mean, Josh Larson would have been the second row team of the week player if it had not been an extra electric performance by Frank Lockhart. Uh, yeah. But, uh, what, what, you know, a 17 fantasy points from second row position. He's another guy in there that mm -hmm. I'm really excited to have in my squad. But a guy that was a team of the week on a read this week at the fly half position. Good to see him back in this list. Jason Putros, 13.9 fantasy points after uh, a big 24 and a half fantasy point performance in round four so he backs that up he now has uh four double straight double digit point performances had 9.9 .9 in round one so basically make it double digit fantasy point performances in every single game that he's started in so far this season 67 yeah. meters gain and just kind of like an iconic jason potro's performance you know he has kind of some of those four meters gained, but yes i know that but two conversion kicks and two penalty kicks which is uh which is just kind of the potros brand when it comes my to favorite thing production. about jason potros is how much he hates tackling so it that's is, my favorite it, thing. It, it is quite funny to watch it is quite funny to watch for sure um right i mean i got a question for you here like mm -hmm. i'm looking at paula balacana mm -hmm. and i've got concerns yep uh i'm watching him in these games and he is not necessarily the a guy that is constantly getting involved. He's sitting below some of his teammates in the back three. I mean, behind Reese McDonald, behind Daniel Morgan, Puderang. When you look at the back three guys on that team, I think he's the one that's probably like, I think Daniel Morgan, Puderang looks better than Paula Balakena. Um, and he just gets more touches. Like he just has more ball in hand. I, ball, Paula Balakena to me disappears. Yeah. He's disappeared all year. And that's the interesting thing. I'm, I'm not going full panic mode with Bellicana right now, at least from a fantasy perspective, he's been adequate, obviously not the value that you drafted him, him at, but he hasn't necessarily killed you yet. But you mentioned the name. I think Daniel Morgan Pedrangi is the reason why that Bellicana is not the Bellicana that we expected going into this season. And, and yeah. they both had 7.6 fantasy point performances in this one. But again, the involvement that we're seeing with Morgan Puderangi rather than Bellicana, it is a concern level. Definitely want to look at other options. Bellicana is coming as that guy that is not a plug and play option anymore. If you mm -hmm. need him in a pinch when, you know, there's these bye weeks happening, you need to play back three guy. He's not going to burn you. But at this point in time, I'm not expecting any crazy performances um, or expecting anything crazy heading into into these matches with him as I would at the start yep. of the year. Yep, agreed. And I think going back to the game we just talked about before, same thing to go with JP Duplessis as well. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, both of those guys a little bit more here. Uh, but a couple other fantasy point performance I want to mention before we move on is uh, Pierce Von Dadelzen, uh Free Jacks, 13 and a half fantasy points for him for the back row. Vian Conradi, 13.4 for him. Vian's kind of been interesting here. Again, another one of yep. those guys that hasn't killed you, but I mean, a 24 tackle point perform, a 24 tackle performance to get you 13.4 fantasy points. That's kind of what he dropped it in as his floor then that safe play um to have him yeah. in that lineup uh reese mcdonald uh goes back up to the top of the boards and the highest points score in fantasy mlr right now with 13 fantasy points matt that uh book it bets uh, that you have as reese mcdonald finishing off as the top back three players looking good once again um and then dan Pryor of miami was really the only relevant guy for miami with 11.6 there uh for the sharks uh okay moving on to the last match of the weekend old glory dc and rugby football club los angeles 
Gorillas, and another thing that we absolutely love. And somehow Old Glory DC finds itself in the thick of it every single time. And that is another tie that we have here uh, with uh, between LA and DC. Uh, DC now is 2-2-2. Two, two, and two. Uh, uh, Los Angeles is one, three, and one, even in a tied in their own record, exactly 22 to 22 tie there. Interesting, Holy match, though. Cow. Two, uh, two, two, and two, 22, 22, Ryan. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, it, the conspiracies, the conspiracies. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Illuminati. But, uh, I mean, thoughts Solar though, eclipses. It's true, which was pretty cool, by the way. Uh, watching that on Monday. Uh, but yeah. what were your overall thoughts on uh, Old Glory DC? Uh, oh, yeah, I mean. I can't believe Old Glory DC got outplayed the way that they did when the LA team is getting five yellow cards and one red. Mm. Uh, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, to me, I think that a lot of positives can come out of this for the LA team. They look quite good defensively. I thought they're picking up that kind of outside in uh, defense, which is clearly being successful. I think that they did really well. I don't think any of the Old Glory DC guys necessarily went off um, in terms of their back line. They're impressively dominant with the man down, I thought, for RCLA. Um, and look, I think, I think, and, and I don't know, I, I think discipline costs RCLA, of course. Mm -hmm. They got five yellow cards. There has to be penalties that cause it. Uh, but I don't think all of those were deserving yellow cards. I mean, man, five yellow cards, Mo, like that is a <laughs> lot to give out in a game. Like, I, 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 I don't know how you feel, Ryan, but I feel like the cards and the, and, there's just been so many more cards this year yeah, and so many more cynical calls that are just happening um, out of the blue. It's like I get two penalties in my 22 and suddenly I'm getting a card. Like I didn't even, you've given me one penalty and I get the same one. I haven't even gotten a verbal warning yet and right. I'm getting a card. Right. Like it's, I, I don't like it. I don't like it as a fantasy manager. I don't like the fact that I have to be worried about my forwards getting, a card, you know, and for simple things like repeated infringements only twice or yeah. for simple things like, you know, Coe's card was soft. Uh, you don't give a card for something as simple as that. And I don't know. I, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I, I feel like this year there's been a lot more no, cards, I agree. a lot more discipline that has been going on throughout the year. And I'm not sure if this is coming down from the top and I don't know why it's coming down from the top. Yeah. Yeah. It's there definitely has felt like there's been a higher frequency of of the cards coming out yeah. here this season so and far. And uh, like from a LA, LA deserved, I don't, I don't understand. Like as a coach, you go into the, you go into the locker room and say, what? Like, Hey, we played 14 men down and we tied a team. Like, right. Right. You, we played 13 down, like two men down at some point and we still tied them and still dominated. Like, right. What right. are you going to do? And when you look at some of those cards, it's like, what can you do? And that's the thing too, right? It's like, I think we're starting because we're also seeing so many of them. It's maybe diluting of how impactful getting a card is. Like, I mean, you're playing yeah. like, and obviously this is pretty obvious for, for rugby aficionados out there, but I mean, playing 14 to 15 and playing a man down is a huge impact, even if it's just for the 10 minutes for that card. But I mean, with the number that they're dishing out, it's just, it's very, very difficult. Um, and I don't yeah. think we, we should and be forgetting that, that to kind of to your sentiment, Maddie, that the fact that LA was able to come out here with a tie with the amount of, of cars that they did see is, is a, is a, is a kudos to them. And you can't even guess, like, it's hard to guess the cards, like right. discipline wise. Yes. Like for example, Jamison Fernando Schultz, like, you know, that if you're going to pick him, yes, he has that great ceiling, mm -hmm. right? That great ceiling, but you know that there's a potential that he's going to get a yellow, that right. he's going to get a red. Right. Regardless of the debate, you yeah. know that he's going to get a yellow. He's going to get a red at some point this season. And you, you know that guys, but like when it comes to five cards in a game, I, nobody would have guessed that there's five cards dishing in game. Nobody would have guessed Co is going to be getting a yellow card. Right. Like, it's, and, that, and that's and that's tough. And that's one of the points I want to bring up from a fan to spin it into a fantasy conversation is that cards, at least the way that the rules are set up right now, have such a big impact in our fantasy yeah. matchups as well. Like, I mean, you're getting minus four points which is huge yep. sometimes um red card minus eight uh and and if yeah, it's if, if it's, if it's the two, Mon, yeah 
it's it's tough but yeah i guess uh we'll, we'll see moving forward and kind of assess that but let's get into some uh, uh individual performances here uh the lone team of the week uh honoree it's actually a uh, a shared honor he already gave out a back Ooh. row player uh earlier to dylan now for utah but semi kunitani also getting 17.2 fantasy points in this one as well he was one of your starts of the week maddie uh for oh, this one for los angeles and he does uh quite well in this matchup there uh 99 meters gained 16 tackles a breakdown steal and a full 80 minutes played there for that bonus 17 17.2 for Semi Kunitani. A couple other guys that did quite well. Uh, Rory Van Boot, 17.1 fantasy mm -hmm. points for LA. Will Leonard looking solid, 16.7 fantasy points for him. He's starting to integrate himself into the lineup after two yeah. straight starts for him, which is good to see. We'll see whether or not that continues more moving forward. And then the last two guys I want to mention, Corey Daniel. If you were able to scoop Corey Daniel up or if you drafted him, 14.9 fantasy points. Corey Daniel, especially with the loss, at least for these next handful of weeks here without uh, Jama Fana. But Jama Fa Nana Schultz, you're going to uh, reap the rewards from Daniel. And then I got to shout out Dan Holland's head because we got a Whatever. message on our on our on our on our Discord and our socials about how rugby wrap up, who again notoriously drafted this guy with their third overall pick, which again we are not advocating whatsoever, but he ended up scoring yeah, try eleven point seven fantasy points for him uh, to yeah, to okay. have an adequate performance. Yeah, tell me when. The points that he's putting up warrants for a third <laughs> overall. But hey, I also took Paula Balakina, and I'm pretty sure Paula Balakina has less points than him. So that's true. Uh, so what can I say? Uh, I really like, yeah. Cor by the way, Corey Daniel Ryan, the guy puts up like what three straight games with 20 tackles. That yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Rory Van Vue, I mean, you have to give him some points for there's got to be a number of points that you can give to him for trying to dummy the defense <laughs> by dummying a pass to absolutely nobody. Yeah, uh, that's got to be at least 10 points. So I'm <laughs> to me, he's got at least 27.1 points. Uh, but yeah, Rory Van Vue was absolutely everywhere. It's nice to see him back in that lineup. Uh, and Will Leonard's interesting too, man. We'll see. Jason Emery, his knee looks pretty strapped up. So we'll see how much he's playing and where James Stokes is. All right. Well, let's uh, let's uh, move it along here, Maddie, and let's start talking about some of these guys that impressed us this past week or these past several yep. weeks and talk about uh, the guys that you should be looking out on your waiver wire. But before we can do that, we obviously have to make some space for these guys that we want to pick up. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some guys that haven't been so uh, so nice to watch here in this season so far. So I'm going to give you some names, Maddie, uh, of All guys right. that uh, that you I like this consider. game. Uh, dropping or keeping uh, we played yep. this game last week and we'll continue we moving forward but another guy i want to bring up and we mentioned his name last week is tony pulu not in the lineup this week against the dallas jackals uh they went with again jade stigling uh ina foodie and uh sorry devin rousseau. and devin rousseau in the uh in the back three uh with the fullback position with kurdrani moving up to that center position what are you doing with tony pulu i think this back line is so tough like they have so many options that they could use. Uh, and we saw Connor Mooneyham come back this week and he looked fairly shifty. He looks like he's back from that knee injury pretty well. Mm -hmm. so they've got so many options there. Um, it's really tough to figure out, figure out who's going to play. I think for me, like you have to be willing to drop Pulu simply because he's not going to be like in, in this fantasy MLR, you can't afford to have guys that don't play. Yeah. Yeah. Can't afford to just have these guys sitting unless they are like the Ed Fitos, you know, the the Jason Potros is the uh the the top of the top guys. You just can't have afford to have these guys just sitting and not consistently playing. Uh so for me, I think Tony Pulu, if you got to make a decision, you got to drop him for for a guy who's a little bit more consistent. And to put it into context, I was put in this situation heading into this week. Uh in this bye week, I needed a second row player, didn't have one. Um, Tony Poo saw that he was not in the lineup. And again, this is someone myself who dropped bank on Tony Poo after yeah. uh, seeing him and, and being him being in that lineup. Uh, I believe I dropped like over $25 on him and it yeah. hurt to drop him, but I, I just can't deal with that inconsistency. Yeah. And, and I mean, I ended up picking Frank Lockhart up because he was available, which looks good right now. But again, just I, know that Pulu is going to have another 20 point game and you have to be okay with it. Yeah. 
that's a it's a very good point. All right, next guy that I want to bring up is uh, Jason Emery. Uh, this is a guy that uh, you know has been somewhat disappointing. Some of that due to injury. Uh, looked like he was kind of banged up in this one again. He hasn't scored higher than seven point nine fantasy points, and that was all the way in round one. Uh, he only played yeah. forty six minutes before he was taken off this time. For me, I think this keeps it nice and short. At this point, I think I'm completely okay with dropping Emery if there's a better option. Yeah. And there'll, there'll be a better option that we're going to talk about here in the waiver wire segment. Look, drop. Him. He's a he's a distributor. Um, he's not the guy that they're gonna use to to really try to try to break the line. He's gonna be the distributor of this offense. All right, two more guys I want to talk about. The next guy is a guy that didn't even appear uh in uh the lineup against an anthem squad, and he's kind of had shot uh spotty appearances here this season so far and that's Kayla McKinney for the Utah Warriors a high of 11.1 fantasy points in round three has not broken the triple digit meters gain mark yet this season yeah. in his three appearances which is what he's known for from a fantasy value wise what are you doing with Kayla McKinney it's tough I mean you're hoping that something comes out where he's injured or something like that because you can at least not have to drop him and make this tough decision uh to me I think I think it's there it's coming um, it's just a matter of when this offense is going to find itself. The offense is going to come back to its form. Um, I think once he's back, he's going to look a lot better. Uh, if I will say this, if you see the lineup back and you see that he's not at 15, I would be a little bit concerned. Uh, and you might want to look to drop him. If he's at 15, I would feel much better with keeping him on my bench. I think now is the time to trade Caleb McKinney. I don't think he's a drop candidate as of yet, Yeah, but I think you want to try to yeah, make but it. What, I think are you, you want what are you trying to, to trade? What are you trying to trade him for though? Right? Well, like, I know, but if you are, let's say, and, and to put context into it, if you are a team that's sitting at one and four or a one and five, two and two and four right now in your leagues, right? You can't wait and find figure out this Caleb McAnany situation, right? Like if you have another option, get some value for him, trade Caleb McAnany to a team that is doing okay and doesn't necessarily need that and try to see if you can find some value because there is a risk here that this could be the turning point where if he doesn't appear in this lineup coming up here, which I don't think is going to be the case, but there is that risk there right now is going to be the most you're going to get from me. You can play the game. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he's going to be able to turn things around as this Utah Wars uh, team figures it out. But it really is at that point where how much time do you have to wait yeah. on this guy to perform if you're sitting kind of in the lower half of your league? If you're sitting pretty and you're like four, or like four and two right now, five and one. Hold him on and see see what happens because it's gonna be a nice addition to your lineup if if he's good. But uh, it's definitely been a roller coaster of a ride between uh, for Kayla McKinney. The last guy yeah. that I'm gonna mention here, Maddie, and I think this is a guy that we both know the answer to. It's just really really hard to see him playing the way he is. That is JP Duplessy. I know this guy is a special place in your heart, one of mm -hmm. the top centers taken off the board. But even in a match, and I really thought this match was gonna be kind of his breakout game because Jordan Jackson Hope wasn't in the lineup and they were gonna really rely yeah. on him here but only 4.7 fantasy points hasn't scored higher than 7.9 since round two. Obviously the stressors there was when he, when he didn't appear in that round one lineup, Jordan Jackson hope when he's healthy has played much better, or at least has had more opportunity than JP Duplessis. And I think Duplessis owners right now are quite worried with what they have. Yeah, I think it's quite a worry. Um, the fact that they didn't even use him in the offense this week was probably worrisome enough. Uh, I think to your point, right? Similar with McInerney, use the name value, get some value for him. See if you can make a trade. See if you can pair two guys up and get somebody who's who's a lot better. But yeah, I, I just think it, I think this is it for JP Duplessis. I don't think that he's going up from here. Uh, the fact that in a game where he started and was the lone kind of star center, uh, and he hardly got the ball, that is that hurts. That hurts for JP Duplessis owners. All right, well, let's uh, let's switch to a more positive note here, Maddie. Let's talk about some guys mm -hmm. that we should be looking out for here on the waiver wire. And we'll start at the front row position. I'll go first. Um, the guy that I'm looking at right here is Ignacio Piccolo of the Chicago Hounds. He's started four straight weeks here for the Chicago Hounds, has played in a large portion of these matches, has a double-digit tackle in round five with 11, has kind of those uh, the, the, the lower end meters gain that you would like to see from a front row player. He has the ability, has broken that 70 minute bonus point mark in round three. So that potential is there for him to be on the field. This is a gun. 
I'm not dropping a lot of fab on this guy, but if you're looking for a guy that has opportunity, Bakulo might be a guy that you might look at who you can expect at the very least three fantasy points from, and he's not going to goose egg you. Uh, Ignacio Bakulo is uh, is my top front row waiver wire guy moving forward so far. Yeah, right. I've got Zura Zavania from the Chicago Hounds. They're playing the Anthem next week. You know what I said in that game? Front row is a team that you pick up when you're playing the Anthem. Um, and I know he was hurt. I think he got hurt in the last game. Uh, didn't play this week, but you're hoping that he's back this upcoming week. Um, again, wouldn't drop too much fab on him just with that questions in the air, but he has a nose for the try line. And especially in a game against the Anthem, I think he could get in there. Absolutely. All right. Shifting over to the second row position now for me, I'm picking up James Scott. Uh, yeah. We've mentioned this many times on the show before. You're finding guys at your second row position that have opportunity. James Scott has that, and he's played uh, 80 minutes plus in almost every single match that he's appeared in, starting started in every single match here for the Chicago Hounds so far, coming off his season-high 18.2 fantasy points with two tries, 37 meters gain, and five tackles this past week. And like you mentioned, Matt, he's going up against the Anthem. The opportunity there to maybe find that try zone might be there for James Scott. Yeah, enough said there. I'll agree with that. Uh, second row, look, it's looking pretty tough, at least in our waiver wire. So hopefully everybody else's waiver wire is looking a little better. All right, back row position now. Uh, Maddie, for you, who are you picking up the back row? I mean, I'm going to go with a guy that didn't even start last week. Uh, but, you know, I'm a fan of Manuel Ardejo. Uh, the fact that he's on waivers is nuts. Um, and I know he might not be in waivers for some of you guys, but... Yeah, he's coming off a pretty big game in week four. Um, and he, I think he's one of the top five guys that I think uh, is going to finish off in this league. And and I, yeah, I, I was just shocked to see him in our waiver wire. Maybe he's not in most waiver wires, but yeah, if he is, I would I would definitely pick him up. And just know that uh, Miami will be on by this upcoming week. So just make sure you yep. know that you have that roster spot that you can bite the yep. bull and you have a back row option going there for me. Yeah, but right, I was just going to say for this is like, our day, if if you have a spot open, like he should not be on any right, waiver right, wire. and that and that's the sentiment that a fantasy managers need to understand is that like there are going to be guys that people are going to drop through these buy me get in weeks to pick up a guy because he's not playing or is coming off of a bad week. Yeah. You got to play the game. Look at where your waiver wires go through. See who's also being dropped, not just at the guys that are yeah. just available going into there because there are going to be names in there. Uh, whether it was Frank Lockhart last week, this week it seems to be Manuel Ardeo. Uh, just find those guys that are being dropped and are finding their ways through the cracks that you can capitalize on because other managers are panicking to fill in their roster. All right. My back row uh, waiver wire pickup is uh, Sion Latu Jr. Uh, for the um, uh, Carolina Anthem. Uh, again, I think it's it's starting to become slim pickings here at that back row position, but this is a guy that has started back-to-back -back weeks. We saw that there's optimism involved with this uh, Anthem team. Every time this guy has played, he's gone double-digit tackles, even in the matches that he hasn't started in. Um, and I having a little bit more confidence in Latu Jr. because he started back-to-back -back weeks. We'll see if he starts again in round seven. Um, he's coming off 84 minutes, played 62 meters, gaining 15 tackles. He might be a guy that, uh, that might provide some value there as like a streaming option if you have a guy that's on Miami or on Seattle here and you need a back row guy to play. Yep, I like that. I like that a lot. Right? All right, shifting on over to scrum half. Uh these next two positions, scrum half and fly half. I mean, it's it's a desert out oh, there. It's, uh, so it's the, tough. there really are no options. I'm just going to give one out there and this is starting to play 3D chess within the game. My pickup this week will be Taz Smith. He uh started for the first time this past week in round 6. He didn't perform necessarily well. 1.8 fantasy points, which is not exactly what you want to see, at least as a pickup. But if you are in need of a scrum half position, this is a guy that has essentially appeared for Los Angeles every single week, even as a sub. So the chances yeah. of him of at least doing something and better than leaving your scrum half position empty, he might not be starting a match, but you can count on that Taz Smith is going to come in and he who knows? You might throw the dice and he ends up scoring a try or something. Um, he's had six tackles in back back weeks, which has led to the 1.8 fantasy points. So again, kind of just a, a shot in the dark, but Taz Smith might be a guy that you can kind of yeah, just throw in there. I'm a I'm a go like look, if you have a spot uh and your scrum half is going on by, uh then you should go have a shot with Jason Higgin. 
I mean, they are facing the Anthem this upcoming week. We have seen some different lineups when teams play the Anthem. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wouldn't be surprised if Jason Higgins ends up getting a start. He's a quality nine. Um, He would fit in there quite well. So I think Jason Higgins, if you, if your nine is going on by, don't put any fab down, pick him up. Nobody else is going to pick Higgins up and have a go and just have him in the roster when the lineup comes out and he ends up starting. And then if he doesn't, you drop him right away and you have at least another exactly. spot you can do something else with. All right, shifting over to the fly half. Again, just slim pickings here, but I'm just going to throw out great and bowed. If he's available yeah. in your league, you can pick him up. This is not something of him as an expectation of him doing anything fantasy relevant, but if Jason Robertson yeah. goes down, Great and Bout is going to be that next man up guy. We saw what he's been able to do fantasy wise last year. We saw what he did in round one at the fly half position. Uh, he definitely does not have as much value if he's in the back three playing fullback. He hasn't started since round two. But again, kind mm-hmm. of just an insurance policy here. If Jason Robertson is to get injured or if they go with a different lineup, Great and Bout might be a guy that you can luckily have as a starting fly half. I'm kind of moving forward. All right, going. Yeah. And did you have a well, fly half guy? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm going with the same logic for scrum half. Um, and he's not in our waiver wire, but I'm sure he's in other team, other leagues waiver wires, but Luke Cardi, uh, go with the same logic. You're hoping that both Carl's, uh, that Carl's is also not starting. Um, and he's not just moving to 15 Luke Cardi getting in there. Luke Cardi kicking for goal. I think he, again, same with Jason Higgins, kind of just see, have him in your roster when they ultimately potentially decide to start him. All right. Shifting on to the center position. Uh, quite a few options here. That, uh, mm-hmm. that you have it, which is nice to see because center is definitely a uh, marquee and very important position when it comes to fantasy MLR. For me, uh, he's a guy that I've mentioned before on the waiver wire, but if he's still available, mm-hmm. pick him up. Junior Gaffa. I mean, back-to-back weeks uh, that he started, played the full 80 minutes. He's coming off of in those starts in back-to-back weeks with a try scored, 12.3 in round five, 18.5 in round six. He's coming off his first triple-digit meters gain performance of the year, had double-digit tackles as well. Again, I think the stereotype and the stigma that you have that Anthem Rugby Carolina, uh, you know, name and label on you that you're going to be lower fantasy product uh, productive, I think has to kind of go away. And Junior Gaffa is a guy that you can capitalize on if you're a center needy team. I would I would drop Fab on on Junior Gaffa here. I would do. Um, you know what? Every and he is. It's not like he has to do this on his own. They're finding him in the offense. He has a space in the offense there, and they are using him well. And when they give him the ball, boy, does he absolutely just rumble. So, um, yeah, it's uh, very – I really like that waiver wire. I would definitely drop Fab on him. For me, Rai, I see James Stokes here. Um, with the whole Emery, just seeing the way that Emery has seen the way that he's strapped up, I just see more opportunity for James Stokes. Not exactly sure why he wasn't in the lineup. Um, but I can see his opportunity continuing to grow, especially coming off that big week three game. Uh, week three game of 22.3 fantasy points, 135 meters gain in a try. Um, I can see, you know, him building off of that and, and kind of making his way back into the lineup. And kind of a consolation prize there with the same sentiment. I mean, to, to go for Will Leonard. You know, if you if you have a backup mm-hmm. option, you know, throw down on James Stokes. If James Stokes isn't available or if you want a backup pickup, throw him Will Leonard there. He's had he's had back to back starts here uh for uh for Los Angeles. Um and uh we'll see whether or not he kind of continues to be a staple of that lineup. Uh how much mm-hmm. fab are you putting on uh Gaffa? I would say you can go as high as 15 to 20 percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, 15, 20 percent. I mean honestly I wouldn't go higher than 15 like total. Uh but yeah, it all depends on how much you got left. Like for me, I'm broke, so I don't know if I can put too much on it. <laughs> all right. And then the last here, back three position. Um, a lot of options here as well. Um, I'm actually going to uh put down uh Dave Kearney. Uh, because who doesn't love to have a owner slash player Jackie on Moon. your lineup, Jackie Moon in your lineup, 8.9 fantasy points in uh, the past match uh, against uh, the uh, NOLA Gold. And they're going up against the Anthem this week. Uh, so this is kind of like one of those streaming options if Kearney is in the lineup. Uh, for this matchup against Carolina, which is also a big if, because like you mentioned, Matt, they also kind of shift their lineups each week. Maybe Kearney wants a uh, a week off, and he's going to give himself that because he is the owner and pays the big bucks. Uh, yep. But if Kearney's there, I, I wouldn't uh, mind taking a flyer on him as one of your streamers. Not dropping any fab on him, but if you need yeah. a back three player this week, I wouldn't mind going Keir, uh, Kearney. 
for me, who I actually would drop the fab on, uh, I mean, he's got a tough matchup next week in Seattle, but moving forward, Roy Van Voot, I think the way that he's involved in that LA offense, like he didn't play for a few weeks, but in the first week he was involved and this week he's very heavily involved. Um, I think that's a very good sign. Um, and the fact that he was able to put up 17.1 fantasy points last week uh, is great. Um, and he's clearly, you know, heavy, heavy part of this offense. So it's, it would be good to have him in your lineup. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then uh, just kind of a uh, last question here as we move on to the week seven preview, Matt, would you drop uh, Caleb McAnany or Rory Van Voot if you had that option right now? Man, that's tough. I no, I ah, uh, that's tough. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I don't know because Roy, you look at Rory Van View because he hasn't, he didn't play like he's, he's got the same issue. Yes, yeah. he's got into very high scoring point game, but like, I think I'm holding one more week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you're saying, I would rather have McInnie getting six points and Van Voot not playing three weeks and then it's getting 17 points one week. It's right? true. Like, it's true. That's it's useless a, to me. It's a, it's a, it's a tough uh, question. We ask the hard questions mm-hmm. here on the Fantasy Record we Show. Sure but do. hey, those are uh, well, some guys to uh, to look out for here. And as we say yeah. every single episode, uh, defense set piece, you punt. You don't got one now, you go punt. for it. Maybe well, our waiver and, wire has some weird ones in there, but if your waiver wire has got some... And if Dallas and or Old Glory DC are in your waiver wire, you better pick them up ASAP and drop everything that you got. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I always look look, look at for defense set pieces that were maybe dropped through the waiver wire period. You can yeah. always uh, go through there. All right, uh, shifting on to the uh, the Week 7 preview. Let's start talking about some of these games, Maddie, and give Let's our predictions it. heading into this, uh, this week. Uh, we'll start off. With the Seoul Friday night matchup, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. The Dallas Jackals at home taking on the Utah Warriors. Oh, I hate uh, when Dallas is home. I know. I know. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a tough stadium to win. Oh. It's, it, is, it is very tough. Did you see, and this is kind of going off topic a little bit, but did you see how they had the XFL game or whatever the, literally the next day and like all the lines, the yellow lines that they used were completely oh, UFL, gone? UFL, Ryan. Or UFL, sorry, yes, sorry. It's United Football League. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, They're united, the XFL and the USFL together. That's to a, create a beautiful beer thing. league football. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, but I just it's a beautiful thing. But yes, I saw that they. I mean, clearly the XFL team has much more money to pay to get the lines changed than the Dallas Jackals do. So um, but let's talk about some of these guys. Who are you looking out for? I think this is really a telltale sign for me for the Utah Warriors. So let's. It, I'm assuming Joel Hodgson is going to be back in the lineup here yeah. this is my make or break for your Utah Warriors stocks. If Kayla McInnie starts in this one and has another pooper. I'm dropping Caleb McAnany after this week. That it's it's kind of yeah. goes similar to that. If there's there's those stocks that you have in Utah, if they just don't perform against this, I think I'm very very concerned uh, about this Utah Warriors side moving forward. The time to yep. wait, especially if you're a team that is needing of wins, you know, as we trudge along through this fantasy season, you just you don't have that time to wait anymore. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think the big matchup for me is Tufuya versus Dylan Nell. I think that's a great matchup to kind of watch. Um, also, Marcel Muller versus uh, Joe Mono is a nice little matchup to watch as well. Uh, yeah, I, I agree on that one. For me, I think I don't think that it's like it's surprising at this point in this season if the Utah Warriors lose to the Dallas Jackals because hey, I think that that's going to happen. Um, but yeah, to your point, it's like, hey, Utah, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't even yeah. have to be a loss. Like Utah can lose this game. I just need to see something fantasy production wise from some of these guys. Like I just yeah, need to they're, see they're gonna a, lose a 10 point performance from you uh, from some of these Utah guys just to give me a little bit of confidence that I it, despite yeah. them struggling from a team perspective, there's some individual performances that I can be confident in. But you're right. I think Dallas Jacks are going to win this one. Yep, Dallas Jackals are definitely going to win. This and one. of course, Vandy sent me his picks. You can probably guess who he's going with. Oh, the losers, and that's classic Vandy. <laughs> and yes, Vandy is going with his boys, the Utah Warriors. I'm going with my de facto boys, possibly moving forward here. Uh, hey, with, uh, with so the, the MLR needs to get you one of those North Star jerseys. <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Uh, shipping on over to the next match on Saturday. Uh, this one should be a fun one. The Houston Sabercats undefeated coming off of a bye, taking on the defensively stout New England Free Jacks. Um, Man, I don't even know where to go with this one. This one's just yeah. this one for me is going to be the matchup of the weekend, and I cannot wait to watch yeah. this matchup between two teams that I think is going to tell us a lot about kind of where they stand. This might be a a a, a final that we see here 
in in uh, 2024. That is true. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be awesome. I think the big matchup here is going to be LaRue Milan and Ben Lesage and whoever Houston decides to put in the center position. That's for me, is going to be the big matchup uh, because when you think about New England defense and that backline defense, it is going to run through that 13, that inside-out defense and mm-hmm. how whatever centers that Houston is going to use to counter that that is going to be the big question, and that is going to be the winner, make or break part of this game. So I'm looking forward to see that. Yeah, I, I'm expecting big games too. Uh, I, I expect somewhat of a kicking match between Potros and Coatser. It'll be interesting yep. to see who lines well, up here. What if Alatimu comes in? That'll be interesting to see. I think more so Alatimu and Potros. I mean, those guys are the exact same player. Yeah, uh, and they will just they will just clinically turn your to turn your defensive line around and i mean to all be, the time and this, all will, night long. and this will kind of back up your statement that you made last episode matt about kind of deciphering a couple episodes ago about when alatimu starts when coaster starts at the 10 position when it's more of a territorial game uh this would be kind of that matchup where you would think that alatimu would start in this one right so we'll see whether yeah. or not that fits and we'll we'll see where that goes uh i'm going to actually pick the new england free jacks in this one i think their oh, defense okay. came out this past week really really solid um and i think that is going to be the kind of make or break here it's tough because free jacks are away but i'll give it to new england this one yeah for me i think houston's offense really is a really nice uh matchup against this new england free jacks defense I think what they bring is speed at the breakdown. They bring a lot of hard running centers to kind of counteract that outside in defense. They bring a lot of hard running forwards, but not just like slow forward play. But when they get in that red zone, they're going to speed it up and really put that defense under pressure. Um, I like the Houston Sabercats here. All right, there we go. And Vandy likes Houston in this one as Let's well. Go. Uh, switching on to now Sunday, uh, San Diego at home taking on the NOLA Gold. San Diego coming up by a uh, bounce back game for the NOLA Gold after the tough loss to Chicago. Um, should be interesting. I'm really liking seeing uh, what Hugh Roach does here. Dylan Fawcett mm-hmm. was able to capitalize on the NOLA Gold and his performance with their set piece tries. I think San Diego and Hugh Roach can do the same thing there if he starts this match. Uh, um, and we'll see whether or not Nola's offense can kind of turn things around. Really, this game can go both ways, but talk about a difficult one to come back from after a tough loss because San Diego Legion's yeah. defense has been looking good so far this season and is a big part why they're four and one. Yeah, and you're hoping if you're a Nola Golds fan or a Jordan Jackson Hope manager that he's back in the lineup, I can see him having a pretty big game here. Um, and and yeah, I mean, I also, also look at Jonah Mo. I also love watching him, San Diego side. You know, we'll see. I, I think I think they'll be pretty good here. I think this is a nice matchup for them to come back from the bye and kind of get that offense going again. Um, yeah, I like San Diego Legion here. I just don't think Nola is good enough defensively to stop the San Diego team. Yeah, uh, I'm going San Diego as well. And so uh, Vandy going Nola in this one. Uh, so we're switching up here. This is this is this is good. Um, yeah. Look, you- I'm not letting my undying faith for Nola to go to the playoffs. Uh, and my my guess for them to make it to the playoffs. At some point, you uh, got to abandon so, shit, Maddie. At some point. Uh, well, they stopped giving my boy JP the ball, so now I'm now I'm out. There you go. All right. Uh, next one on uh, Sunday, the Chicago Hounds taking on the Carolina Anthem at home. I think we all know our answer to this one. Maybe we'll see. But Chicago two, three, and one, zero oh, and six in this one. Uh, I'm playing a whole bunch of Chicago players. A lot of the reason why I had a bunch of Chicago guys in my waiver wire pickups this week. Um, I'm excited to see what Meeks is able to do um should be it should be an interesting one to see and i think it would have been a different story if chicago had lost badly to nola and we're heading Mm -hmm. into this one uh with chicago kind of not as being as optimistic maybe we get burned here in that way because there's that recency bias but i think i'm a lot more confident in chicago this week than i was two weeks ago and i'm going to pick chicago here to beat the carolina anthem very true i think chicago definitely does look a lot better there are able to get the ball wide and that's something that anthem struggles defending against i think what sucks for anthem is they're hoping that david still is back i know that he left the game with injury um but yeah i mean look for big games from i would see that this is going to be a pretty big breakout game for nate oxberger mm-hmm. um i think he's he's due and a game against the anthem is probably the perfect time to do it um and yeah, I mean, with all that being said, I'm going to go with the Anthem here and take them taking Chicago for a ride and taking the win. 
You're taking the anthem. I think that's back to back weeks. That or you picked the anthem the couple no, weeks I before picked, against yep, Miami. I, I did, and so, I picked Miami against New England Free Deck, which is stupid. You might I don't pick, know why I did that. <laughs> you might uh, be uh, our in-house Carolina fan. We'll see. Um, all I right. will never. <laughs> all right, shifting on to the last match of the weekend. Uh, RFC Los Angeles taking on the Seattle Seawolves, 6 o'clock Eastern on Sunday. This one's going to be an interesting one. I think Los Angeles is is growing, and they have looked lethal at times, but this is a tough match against a Seattle Seawolves team that is even that much more lethal. But again, they've uh, they've shot themselves in the foot at times here, the Seawolves, but we'll see how that looks here in a, in a West Coast matchup. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I mean, hopefully they don't have Mo refing, or else they're going to get probably six yellow cards. So uh, we'll <laughs> see when the refing list comes out. But yeah, it'll be a tough one for RFC LA. Uh, I think Seattle is going to come back pretty strong. And if Davida Kurajani is playing, they can only get better and their offense can only look better. Um, and the RCLA team is going to have a rough go. Yeah. Uh, I'm going Seattle in this one. That sounds like you're going Seattle in this one. Maddie yep. and Vandy is going Seattle in this one. What a so uh, to go overall, uh, I'm taking Dallas. Maddie's taking Dallas. Vandy's taking Utah. I got Houston. Maddie's, or yeah, I got New England. You and Vandy got Houston. Uh, mm -hmm. Vandy's got Nola. You and I have San Diego. Matthew, you're taking Carolina. I and Vandy am taking Chicago. And then we are all on the same page when it comes to Seattle. 25-6-2, uh, and two, I am. You are 25-6-2 and two as well. So you and I are tied. Maybe that can make a difference this week. And uh, yep. Vandy, 22-9-2, large part in sticking with his Utah boys. We'll see whether or not that can help yeah, him or hurt stink. him again this week. We'll see. But hey, another uh, exciting uh, weekend of matches, Matt. It's going to be a good one, a whole bunch to look out to and i think a whole lot to discover here uh heading into week seven yep for sure uh you know saturday night's gonna be a good one so just counting down the day so that one because that one's gonna be a big saturday night light sir absolutely all right well if you aren't already like we said the top of the show follow us at the fantasy ruckers facebook instagram x follow like uh, subscribe on youtube check out our website thefantasyworkers.com join our discord community link to do that is below in the description got a whole uh, bunch of fun people over in that community uh and vandy hopefully will be back next week after his excursion from baltimore where i can tell him that uh, i am his boss now yes sir we'll see all right well for maddie for myself Ryan, for devin vandy vanderpool we'll see you next week for another episode of the fantasy record show miss you Vandy. You've been listening to the Fantasy Ruckers Show, bringing fantasy rugby to the masses, covering everything rugby from the MLR and beyond. We hope you enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and be sure to tell all your friends. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, connect with us on social media at the Fantasy Ruckers. Till next time, this is the Fantasy Ruckers Show, signing off.